welcome to all of you. Um, my name is Bill McGarvey with Fellowship of Reconciliation. It's great to be with you again for the second session of the uh, Powers That Be book club on behalf of the Wink Fellowship uh, book club that we have. And we are hosted tonight uh, by the fellowship, but also by uh, our the inaugural uh, Wink Fellow, which is Dr. Fernando Ona, uh, who has uh, done a number of things for us and we and really launched us a, a, the, the final Thursday of January with uh, the first session. It really was a wonderful time. And so, so great to see so many of you back here tonight, especially under, I know, difficult circumstances in the world. And I'm sure we're going to get to that. Um, we're going to pretty much use the same basic structure as last time. Uh, just so you know, I, I just wanted to just bring your, given what's going on in the world, I wanted to bring your attention to what I just put in the chat, which is um, the Fellowship of Reconciliation's uh, Ukraine statement that is was was is going to be upgraded with a couple edits that Susan Smith has asked us to put in, but we've had some issues on the back end of the website. But for what it's worth, this is the first version of the statement on Ukraine, the fellowship. You're the first people to really see it. So I put that in the chat just to 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 share that with you if you care to look at it. I also encourage you, if you haven't got a chance, that, that uh, in between each of these, uh, each of our episodes, so to speak, each of our sessions, uh, Fernando will speak uh, two weeks after this with a uh, colleague or a friend in the work he does uh, uh, regarding something that sort of touches on the next upcoming uh, issues that we're going to be we're going to be tackling in the book club. So, two weeks ago, we had a great conversation with Steve Bingaman from the Outdoor Church in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is an amazing organization that has uh, church uh, has church services outside all year round um, uh, in Cambridge. And uh, Fernando has been a, 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 somebody who's on the board for them. And, and they had a great conversation that talked about uh, domination systems. So I encourage you to go see that at our page, which is uh, the, the Wink uh, Book Club page, which is forusa.org slash Wink. Uh, so please go to that. And I just want to say that we've talked about this in some of our meetings among the staff for, for FOR. I just want to welcome people back because it's been a, the, the pandemic's gone on for a long time. And the Fellowship of Reconciliation, I know Anthony Nicotero, who's the co-interim executive director, is on here, okay. too. Uh, he will have a couple of words to say for us later. But just for those of us, for those of you who maybe haven't been in touch with the fellowship lately uh, or just uh, maybe had been away from us for a while, we just want to welcome you back. Uh, and we love having you here and we hope you stick around and, and continue to engage us. It's, it's easier than ever really now that we're doing so much online uh, and we want to hear from you. So uh, please email us, please go to our website, please sign up for our, our, our emails when we do send them out. It's just good to have you here. So I just wanted to welcome people back because I don't think I neglected to do that because I think we've heard from a lot of people who haven't been with us in a while. Uh, so great to be with you all. Thank you again for so many of you showing up. We love hearing you, love your reactions. We will have a recording of tonight posted as soon as I can get it edited after tonight. Um, and uh, I, after you know, after saying all this, I want to to thank Susan Smith for being here from the fellowship as well as Anthony. And I want to uh, now introduce uh, Dr. Fernando Ona, our inaugural Wink Fellow. He'll take us from here. So welcome everyone. And before we begin today, um, given what is happening in the world and given what we have read um, from Dr. Wink today around the domination system and, and Jesus as a way through because it comes from his tradition as a Christian as well as mine and, and recognizing that we all may come from various traditions. But Jesus is a model through which we'll be talking about today. I thought we would begin to hold prayer for Ukraine, hold prayer for fallen powers and hold intercessory prayer for, for the redemption of the powers and to keep in, in tension what Dr. Wink reminds us of consistently, that the powers are good, the powers are fallen and the powers can be redeemed. And so I wish to hold four prayers and lift them up. So the first prayer is a Pueblo prayer from the First Nations. Hold on to what is good, even if it's a handful of earth. Hold on to what you believe, even 
if it's a tree that stands by itself. Hold on to what you must do, even if it's a long way from here. Hold on to your life, even if it's easier to let go. Hold on to my hand, even if someday I'll be gone away from you. Our second prayer comes from the Eastern Orthodox Church, and it is a prayer for peace. Almighty God and creator, you are the God of all people on the earth. God, I pray, guide all the nations and their leaders in the ways of justice and peace. Protect us from the evils of injustice, prejudice, exploitation, conflict, and war. Help us put away mistrust, bitterness, and hatred. Teach us to cease the storing and using of implements of war. Let us lead us to find peace, respect, and freedom. Unite us in the making and sharing of tools of peace against ignorance, poverty, disease, and oppression. Grant that we may grow in harmony and friendship as brothers and sisters and siblings created in your image to your honor and praise. I also wanna lift up a biblical verse that Dr. Wink mentions in the fourth chapter. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And finally, I wish to end with a prayer from the Sioux people. Fill us with the light. Give us the strength to understand and the eyes to see. Teach us to walk the soft earth as relatives to all that live. Amen. So as we settle into this evening to speak about the two chapters, chapter two and chapter three, I wanna first just note that um, Dr. Wink's uh, deep partner in life, uh, June Keener Wink is here with us tonight. Um, and I wanna lift that up because she is a peacemaker um, and is amongst us to think about and critically engage with Dr. Wing's words that you read on the, these two chapters about the domination system and about Jesus as a way through, because that is their model for us to understand, Christian or any other religion that we are in, that we are connected to an understanding of how we name and unmask and then engage with the powers. Um, even if they are fallen, recognizing that they can be redeemed. So I want to just honor that and thank you, Jean Keener Wink, for being here this evening um, and being with us again. 
So I thought we would begin by, I'm hoping everyone received the quotes that were sent out by FOR earlier this week. Um, and I'm just gonna um, go through the quotes and as well as just sort of fill in why I've chosen those quotes um, so that we can spend time together um, in our breakout rooms to really discuss deeply um, the quotes, but also what what drew you in what 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 invites you to think about the domination system, as well as Jesus's answer to domination, I mean, how Dr. Wink sort of conceptualized this this framework for us to engage with the powers, because he's setting us up for that um, later on in this book, as well as in the tri trilogy. Um, I opened with a prayer to the Beatitudes because this is where it, the link between naming, unmasking, and then engaging with the powers reminds us where, where we stand and where our actions reside with each other. It reminds us of a deep belonging with each other through the labyrinth of what Dr. Wings talks about um, as the domination system. And so what is the domination system? This is the first thing coming out of this chapter, right at the beginning. Dr. Wink invites us to really interrogate this and think about this. And I want you to really think about how this is in relation to what is going on in our world today. We are witnessing, right? We are witnessing the domination system alive and well, right? We are witnessing the fallen powers engaging with, right, um, sort of very powerful tropes like religion, right, and braiding these together, right, to, to almost mesmerize and distract us from each other, right, to create discord and to create separation, isolation, dehumanization. And at this beginning of this chapter, Dr. Wink brings us into what is domination and then drops us into the story right, drops us into the stories of his witnessing of, of domination and is really asking us that it's not so far from us, that it's actually close to us, right? That closeness is actually very intimate. It's not something happening over there. Ukraine is here with us, right? The stories that we see on TV or listen on the radio or hear on a podcast or read on the internet are really intimately connected to us here and now and present. And that part of this story, right, sets us up to think about this labyrinth of the domination system in relationship to then defining what this domination is, the definition of the domination system, which is on page 39, right? Before we get to the quote on 42, he sets us up. And if you read with me, right, on, in the middle part, the system is here. It is here. It's not somewhere out in the distance. It is surrounding us. We are living in this system, right? This is after he speaks to the powerful example coming out of South Africa, right? During apartheid. Here is Dr. Wink going, the system is here, right? relating to how people talked in South Africa about a police person coming up to the door, right? And that the people in that household are responding, the system is here. The system is here with us too, right? And the system is lying again. The system is lying again. This is the other thing to keep in tension as we speak in our breakout rooms. And I just wanna invite you into the space of what lies are we being told and how do we navigate through the lies, right? How do we navigate through the people that we care and love about who are in our lives that have listened to the lies? How do we stop the noise, right? What lies have been told to us and what lies do people believe? And be, be below this, near the last part of that paragraph, Dr. Wink then really helps us understand this definition that he will unpack over the course of this chapter. The overarching network of powers is what we are calling the domination system. And it is characterized by unjust economic relations, oppressive politi political relations, 
biased race relations, patriarchal gender relations, hierarchical power relations, and the use of violence to maintain them all. This is the grounding, the foundation for which we believe and understand what this domination system that Dr. Wink is bringing us to, to really become aware of, right? And it endures in the stories we tell, in the myths, more precisely, the myths, the myths that we create. And it undergirds this basic structure that has been in existence for thousands of years. Right? And so you can read how, right, how these system, systems, these myths translate into right, actual violence, right? It translates into justified violence, justified wars, justified dehumanization. And I invite you to think about how he says, how these social systems become rigidly hierarchical. This is very important for me at least, is to think about how these systems are rigid. They're black and white systems. There's no nuance, simple, right? It's hierarchical, authoritarian, patriarchal, right? And that those in power created or evolved these new myths, as he writes on page 41, to socialize women, the poor, and captives into their now inferior status. This process of dehumanization or becoming non-human, right? that reinforces the scaffolding of the domination power, right? The scaffolding to reify, to reinforce, to amplify violence, to justify that violence. And that's why on page 42, we get to the quote that I wanted to highlight, right? A do domination system must have a domination myth. That is really powerful to me, right? That awareness on page 42 that, wow, not only this, this system needs a really powerful myth, right? A story to explain how things got this way, right? For a story told often enough and confirmed often enough in daily life ceases to be a tale and is accepted as reality itself, as reality itself. And when that happens, people accept the story, even if it is destroying their lives, even if it's destroying their lives, this belief that violence saves further down that page, right? Right, is so successful because it doesn't seem to be mythic in the least. It's actually really real, right? It's real, this, this is not a myth anymore. Violence simply appears to be the nature of things. Dr. Wink writes, it's what works, it seems inevitable. The last and often the first result, right? Resort in conflicts. If a God is what you turn to when all else fails, vine neck with each other, but instead to be fearful of each other, right? This is why I was, I was, I was loving that story of where Dr. Wink writes about you know, Popeye and Bruto and olive oil. I don't know if you, if you, I grew up with this cartoon, right? And it was just phenomenal to me that, wow, I was so, I, like, I did not understand that cartoon in this framework, right? To really rethink about all the characters of this cartoon. Innocuous in my everyday life growing up in the United States in a rural part of the United States in the Northeast and going, oh, this is a beautiful like example of, right? Weakness beating up, right? Brut brutality, bruto, right? To save, right? Olive oil. And it was interesting to me that Walter Wink on 44 writes, neither party ever gains any insights or learns from these encounters, right? Of this constant cycle of, I'm gonna get beat up and then, you know, olive oil gets taken, right? And then I'm gonna, I'm, you know, here's Popeye popping open the can of spinach. And that cycle of violence, right? is a repeat and a repeat and a repeat. And that myth is a repeat of older myths. 
around redemptive violence that is connected to the domination system. And as you know, you read through, right, Marduk and Tiabat and Dr. Wing so beautifully talks that theology of how that myth of redemptive violence is the story of victory over chaos, right? That is the foundation of, right, our religions, right? These myths inform and animate, right? But forgetting that, right, that these myths are myths, right? That we turn into reality. And hence, whoever controls the cosmo cosmo oh, I can never say this word, cosmology, right? Controls the children. Whoever controls, it's on page 50, right? Cosmon cosmology, right? The birth of the world, right? The birth of the world. Who controls for me, this is what peace and justice advocate and sociologist Johann Geltung talks about. Whoever controls the symbols of culture, right? Controls generations. Cultural violence is because the powers control the symbols of violence, right? And those powers are fallen, right? In uncovering the domination system, it's for us to understand, right? How we, how the system, this domination system bypasses, right? Often bypasses rules and regulations of rights holders, not of duty bearers who, right, are supposed to be in service to all of us, right? Because they represent all of us and actualize what we all cooperatively need, right, to flourish, right? And Walter Wink beautifully speaks to how, how the domination, domination system infiltrates and scaffolds into right, the duties and obligations to fulfill, right, the flourishing of rights holders, right, our right, right, our right to clean air, to food, right, to water, but more so our right to connect to each other, to remember each other and recognize how we can work and cooperate with each other. Instead, this domination system replays itself over and over again, like in 51. This continues this repetition, right? Without any awareness of on the part of those who repeat it, right? It becomes part of the cycle of violence that continues to rotate. And all of you are like, Fernando, oh my gosh, what do we do? How do we like... But remember what, what Dr. Wink is inviting us into is that before we do anything and engage with the powers, first name and unmask this. First name and unmask this and become deeply aware of how this domination system operates, right? How this happens, right? How it, how it navigates in our everyday lives, right? And how it orients towards evil, right? Towards, right, this work towards, right? Fallenness, and I would actually say it's more fallenness because in a way I feel that Dr. Wink is inviting us to consistently remember that the powers can be redeemed, right? That in the fallenness, right, we can actually find the way through, right? But it is powerful because the domination system draws us in and thinks of evil outside of ourselves. Does that make sense? So in that bottom of, of 53, right? We never may never outgrow the need to locate all evil outside of ourselves. So he says themselves, I'm always just saying, invite us to remember that we can also get, right? pulled into this domination system because we ourselves collectively and individually can be fallen, right? How do we name and unmask so that we can recognize and become aware of how we place evil outside and that evil can be easily attributed to, right? Whoever we wish to target for violence. 
So that was really important for me in reading this, right? In reading this chapter, chapter, right? Because it's it's this reminder that on the next page, Dr. Wing says on 54, they continue to depend on the group identification and the upholding of social norms for a sense of well-being. That our grounding, right, can be part of that myth because we may believe in this social norm of this group is evil out there. God forbid it's not us. Right? It becomes this us them. And the invitation is to see and recognize how the domination system can infiltrate throughout, right? Infiltrate throughout. On 56, as we keep on going on, we recognize how Dr. Wing says, here a power is made absolute. So when he connects redemptive violence and the national security state, we are seeing this now, right? In our everyday not just outside in you know, Russia, Ukraine, but I'm inviting you to also think about where we are in the United States, how we are as people, why we are in spaces of deep polemics, right? This us and them, right? There can be no other gods before the nation, right? And that the myth of redemption, redemptive violence thus serves as a spirituality of militarism, right? This is what we're in right now, right? We are in this at the moment. The vestiges of the Cold War are no longer vestiges. They're alive and well, right? Many of us grew in that space of the Cold War, but in a way, right, that never really dissipated because we didn't really redeem the powers, right? And it's an invitation to keep on in this process, not an outcome, but in a process of consistent redemption of the powers, right? On page 59, before we get to the next quote, Dr. Wink writes, It was just amazing for me to read this 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 piece about he's he's telling us about an Ohio man in a church meeting during a debate on freezing the deployment of nuclear missiles. And I just was this was just so remarkable to me because it's something that I think it's still relevant today. You've got to remember this. This gentleman says we are Christians, but we are Americans first. Is this like today? Or what? I don't. I mean, like, I, I, Dr. Wink wrote this book right a while ago. This is like, I, but I feel like, wow, I probably would have heard this right in some of the churches I grew up around. Now, right, put it to the test. Which would cause the greater outcry: removing the American flag from your church sanctuary, or removing the cross? I mean, wow, like. Uh, I'm really curious what even every so I, I'm inviting you all to discuss in your breakout rooms. That's something right there. Put it to the test. I don't know, right? And then subsequently he brings us into why do the oppressed submit to such a myth? Because I'm still mystified by this itself, right? And he 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 gets us to this place on the next page, right before the quote I've asked you guys to, to read before coming in. Promise of salvation, right? This promise of salvation, right? But more so, Dr. Wink invites us to go, wait a second, wait a second. People today no longer are bound together by the values, rights, and customs that gave a sense of belonging in traditional cultures. Belongingness, belongingness. This is like, this is the core to me, right? As part of the mitigation to the domination system that Dr. Wink really sets us to up for, to really imagine in this space, to broaden our horizon, to really critically think about what is going on? Because in the domination system, we're set apart, us and them. And here's Dr. Wink reminding us that, wow, in his time, when he's writing this, at the moment he's writing this, which I think is still today, for me, it's still alive today, right? We, are no, we have forgotten our belongingness to each other, right? Without these moorings, there are, we become easy victims of the fads of style, 
opinion and prejudice fostered by the communications media. At once isolated and yet absorbed into the masses, people live under the illusion that the views and feelings they have acquired, right? The views and feelings that they have acquired by listening to the media are their own. Overwhelmed by the incomprehensible size of corporations, bureaucracies, universities, the military, the media icons, individual sense that their only escape from utter insignificant lies in identifying with these giants and idolizing them as true bearers of their own human identity. That just blew me away. I, I just have to invite you into this space because it just speaks to how are we in community with each other and not just in the echo chambers of the communities we feel comfortable in, but how are we? This is like, to me, this the mooring that Dr. Wink talks about, right? Our anchor points that we all belong with each other and we need to engage with each other to remember each other's humanity, right? So on, six, on 61, the last quote of this chapter that I wanted to raise was the myth of redemptive violence is in short absolutism. I really wanna to get to this absolute, it's almost this, uh, this holding up of this black and white polemic. National, national becomes absolute. The myth speaks for God, for God. <laughs> this is like very powerful. I, you know, he italicizes this for a reason. It's for God. It does not listen for God to speak. It's not with God. God is not with us and among us, right? Right? But for God, right? It does not listen for God to speak. This is very powerful writing for me. It evokes, invokes the sovereignty of God as its own. It does not entertain the prophetic possibility of radical judgment by God. It misappropriates language, symbols, and scriptures of Christianity. We are in a space of na Christian nationalism. There are people amongst us, right, who are adherents of Christian, of Christian nationalism. But to me, that's a misappropriation of the language, symbols, and scriptures of Christianity. It does not seek God in order to change it embraces God in order to prevent change, to prevent change is not the impartial ruler of the nations, but a tribal God worshiped as an idol. And this is really important, this next sentence for me. It's metaphor is not the journey, but the fortress. It is not the process, but just this fortress of an outcome that binds us, right? Moated, I imagine this fortress with a moat around it, right? that's impervious, impervious to evolution, change, growth, iteration, generative nature, right? Its symbol is not the cross, but the crosshairs of a gun. See the setup here, it's so beautiful that Dr. Wink writes this. It's a symbol is not the cross, right? But the crosshairs of a gun. Its offer is not forgiveness, but victory, right? It's good news is not the unconditional love of enemies, but their final elimination. Its salvation is not the new heart, but a successful foreign, foreign policy. It usurps the revelation of God's purposes for humanity in Jesus it is blasphemous. It is idolatrous and it's immensely popular. It is immensely popular. I feel like Dr. Wynn is just starting to preach to us right now, right? In the second chapter, right, he closes us up because we're waiting for what, well, Dr. Wink, where are you bringing us? What do, we, what do we do? I don't wanna be in this despair, but there's deep hope because he's made us aware of, he's named and unmasked. He's naming and unmasking this domination system for us, okay? And I'm inviting you into this space of how are we aware of, right? How are we aware of how the domination system is, the metaphor in this domination system is not the journey, but the fortress. How are we becoming aware of, right, this? 
Because in chapter three, right? And this is why I entered in the Beatitudes at the beginning as one of the prayers to, for us to start with, right? Right at the set, right at the get-go, Dr. Wink is going, well, there is an answer. In his tradition, which just happens to be my tradition, right? There is the model of Jesus, right? Jesus is the answer to domination. And this sets us up for chapter three. And he begins with Matthew, right? This in the Beatitudes, right? The Beatitudes orients us toward, right? A remembering of the other that is ourselves, right? The other that is a marginalized is us, right? The outcast, the marginalized, and this wholly unconventional treatment, right? And he goes through the litany of things, right? Of women, children, the rejected, right? Because he's setting us up in contrast to the domination system, what does it look like to be in a, in, in a domination-free order, God's domination-free order, the sacred's domination-free order, okay? And in a way, what he talks about as the egalitarian prophet in the Christian tradition, Jesus, which can be found in many of the other traditions of the great religions of our world, as well as the earth, earth, earth spiritualities, as well as for folks who believe deeply in science, right? Or no religion, that this egalitarian prophet, equity, right? is really connected to relationality and relationships and invites us to really consider what does it mean to be in relationship, right? Buddhists often talk about what is right relationship, right? When I imagine what that is within our, in the tradition I come from, right? What does it mean to maintain a domination free relationship? He speaks of this in the Christian context with the disciples, Right. And Jesus' model with his chosen family, his community. Right. Breaking domination means ending inequity, ending, right? Ending inequity, ending exploitation. Right. And this leads us into the first quote of this chapter on page 67. It is rather the poor whom God elects and blesses, the meek and the brokenhearted and the despised who will inherit God's coming reign on earth. It is the merciful, not the mighty, the peacemakers, not the warriors, the persecuted, not the aristocrats who will enter into the joy of God. In the parable, in parable after parable, right, Jesus speaks of the reigning of God using images drawing from everyday life, farming, right, and women's work, not warfare, and king's palaces. It is not described as coming from on high down to earth. It rises quietly and imperceptibly out of the land. It is established not by the armies and military might, but by an electable process of growth from below among the common people, amongst us all. How do we engage with each other in relationship with each other, even if it's uncomfortable coalitions, uneasy coalitions? How are we get engaging with each other right? And in the spectrum of our stories with each other, that we all are not all going to be the same, but in that beautiful spectrum, how are we engaging in, right? From below the processes of growth, of evolution, right? Because right in the next page, you see Dr. Wink going, if you don't do this, guess what? Right. If we persist in unfairness of inequity, right, in the unfair distribution of goods, right, that requires violence. I almost feel like enough said, right? Right. That requires violence, right? 
And all of the things that create that inequity is connected to the domination system. Right? But the, the, the mitigation, right, the redemption piece, right, is to not only name and unmask, but engage, right? Engage in this work. And he, lo he literally leverages Jesus's life as a way, as a model, right? As a model to confront these structures of inequity. Because by the time of 76 and 77, and that's why our next quote on page 77, Dr. Wink notes, right, deeply notes, okay, that Jesus renounces the family as constituted by genetic bloodlines and offers an alternative, a new family made up of those whose delusions have been shattered, who are linked not by the deepest of all bonds, the blood tie, but by solidarity in the work of God. I, I just have to say, you know, like when this is like, oh my gosh, I have relatives who actually believe in Christian nationalism. These are my bloodlines. These are people I am deeply related to by blood. And I'm like, wow, no, I can't. I need to be with chosen family, right? Who have shattered, who've done the hard work, right? of shattering delusions, of breaking apart the myth of redemptive violence and the myths, right? The deep myths that structure and uphold the domination system, right? We are in solidarity with the work of God, right? Blood or a final, right? If it's a bloodline or a chosen line, but here, through the model of Jesus, Jesus is the model for, wait a second, Jesus is not saying family sucks, right? Jesus is going, wait a second, be clear about the family you keep, right? Right? Have they gone through the work, the process, right, of shattering, right, the myths that they live by? Or are they in the fortress, scared of the other, wanting to hoard their wealth, right? to keep resources away from other people? Does that make sense, right? So this is this idea, right, of this work of what is constituting this family, right? Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Note the deliberate omission of the father, because here Dr. Wink is really telling us, hey, be aware, right? How, you know, to me, this is a, a, a nod to like toxic masculinity in our culture and society that has created a patriarchal hierarchical disassociation from each other, right? There is no, so here, Mark 10, 29, 30, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, but no fathers. Again, Dr. Wink is not going, hey, father suck. Just recognize how the domination usurps right, and substitutes, right, patriarchal systems of violence, right, that become toxic in our everyday lives. Does that make sense? I'm inviting you into this. And in conversation, have that conversation about what does that mean, right, when Jesus subverts all patriarchal structures, when Jesus subverts all patriarchal structures, Dr. Wink remarks, uh, 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 cites Dr. Fiorenza, right? A feminist Christian scholar here, right? And uplifts this work up as an example of, it's not anti-father, right? Let's just be clear, it's not anti-father, but it's certainly recognizing how patriarchal systems are connected to the dominant, right? This dominant structures of violence. Yeah, and that's why I lift up that particular quote, which I invite you to really to interrogate because this male supremacy, right? This male supremacy creates this hierarchy 
of us them. There are others who are who are less than, who are not not as superior as. Is that and that's the invitation to really critically think about, right? Because on seventy nine, right, he goes like every power, the law is at once good, fallen, and need of redemption. The structures are good, fallen, and in need of redemption, right? And to really critically think about what is the true spirit of us together as communities, right, as humans in this world. And that brings us to the lat to the conclusion on page 81. And I love this quote because this quote lifts up what I feel in this conclusion, this Jesus' answer to domination, that violent revolution fails. It fails because it is not revolutionary enough. I mean, that is just brilliant writing. But the, the deepness of that theology, that is what is the most remarkable to me, that it is not revolutionary enough, right? It changes the rulers, but not the rules, the ends, but not the means. Most of the old repressive values and delusional assumptions will remain intact. When Jesus envisioned what Jesus envisioned was a, was a world transformed where both people and powers are in harmony with the ultimate and committed to the general wel welfare, what some prefer to call the kingdom of God. I love this kinship, kinship. And I would invite you into a space of remembering that previous quote, chosen kinship, right? Didn't have to necessarily be blood. It's kinship, belongingness, which I deeply appreciate that Dr. Wink is, is reminding us of, right? How Jesus is the model for that transformative process, process of being in kinship with each other, right? Because, because, right? We, each of us, each of us, need to go beyond this not revolutionary enough, right? That's the invitation here for me that I love about Dr. Wink. He's inviting us to, to the, the most revolutionary action is to remember our kinship with each other, right? Our belonging to each other, to remind us if you're Christian that Jesus is that model for that kinship, right? And so I invite you as we go into our breakout rooms to consider these quotes and to wrestle with them and to wrestle with them within our context of now as we witness the horrors that are happening in Ukraine. But as we also witness on these American shores, right? What is also going on, right? With the domination system and how we in this context, remember our belonging and our kinship with each other. That's great. Thank you, Fernando. Um, such a rich amount of material to look at and to pour over and to talk about. And we want you to do that in your small groups. They're going to be nice and small. We have four or five people in the group. So uh, I'm going to hand this over to you have about 25, 25, 25 minutes to talk, maybe 30 minutes. I uh, really hope you can get into some really powerful stuff and we will keep you posted as to when we're Welcome back, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome back. Uh, I think all the rooms are back, I believe. And um, I wanted to spend the balance of time we have together. We have about 10, 15 minutes that we have left together. Um, that, uh, you know, we wanted to hear from each of the groups or what, however people wish to, to share what um, they were wrestling within the groups um, and just some thoughts or, or comments. So, but Emily, I'm gonna invite anyone wanna to start us off um, in this engaged place. What did people think of the quotes, by the way? Were they helpful to get beforehand? I just was, you know, and was that, did people resonate with those quotes or did they feel like there were other quotes that 
um, that that they highlighted when when you were reading um, the the chapters. And you know, uh, you know, feel free to use the chat as you can see um, if you wish to share. Go for it, James. Yeah, in, in our group, uh, somebody asked. Um, somebody asked me what, uh, you know, what was, what was I up to about it? And, and, uh, the conversation came up about, for me, what I shared was the, my, there's two main parts. One is I've got to, I've got to look at judgment within myself. I've got to look yeah. at how I'm actually, uh, dealing with the oppressors in my life, which I have been working on quite a bit the last few years. And, and Walter's uh, work has been a great assistance to me about that. And the second thing is to be active in my life about making a, a difference in addressing the domination system that exists, which is it coming way more into my attention right now. Uh, you know, read uh, reading the powers of be and and uh, and and thinking just about how important it is that that we stand up and that and that we embrace um, an awareness that that we have that we have overcome, like. It's a manifestation idea that I think I believe is biblical. Maybe it's prophesying, but that, but that um, you know that we like the, uh, John Lennon and Yoko Ono's um, campaign "War Is Over." Like embrace, uh, you know, the, the he heaven on earth, and so it's so it's a, it's a two part thing there. And um, we were dealing a little bit in our group with um, with just how challenging that was to um, to find a prayer for the oppressor. Mm, finding a prayer for the oppressor. Wow. And to, to work on how we ourselves engage in judgment, right? It's a yeah. really powerful thing, James. I mean, sort of engaging um, actively in life. And that, you know, in our previous session, um, which I don't know if you were part of or not, but, we were, but, you know, Dr. Wink in the first couple of chapters really leans into what is our divine vocation. So thinking about, you know, so the connection between what, you know, when you engage with this work, what is your, how are you part of, right? The transformative process of redeeming the powers, right? Mm -hmm. And that it's not to, to take a whole system, right? Which can be really overwhelming, but really to lean into the divine vocation, mm -hmm. what you're mm -hmm. called to do. Yeah, nice. Absolutely. So I really appreciate that, James, and that group. Um, I really, and, and Mary Ryan Hotchkiss says in the, the chat, chat um, you know, which is similar to what was said too, what James was saying, that Bruce reminded us to address the evil and violence in ourselves, right? So it's not only just judgment, but also, um, you know, so the fallenness and the violence that we also may perpetuate, um, that we may be part of those systems. So thank you for that. Mary, did you want to say anything more about that or anyone else in that group want to lift that up um, at all? Well, we did talk about also uh, seeing models for non-dominating societies, non-dominating families. Um, what are the, some of the baby steps we could take? One person suggested inviting people off the street to participate in uh, church dinners, potluck dinners. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for that, Mary. And I, I appreciate that. If you... Um... Uh, listen to my chat that I have with my brother, Stephen Bingaman, and we're talking about the outdoor church, but this sort of, what does it mean to, to orient ourselves towards radical hospitality with another that we would not normally encounter or engage with, or that we may have fear and anxiety about, such as the unhoused, right? And so how does that ministry engage with, right? Navigating in a way, right? It's, and, and to me, it's, 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 it may be a, a small thing, right, Mary? But it's like this, it actually, it, it's, it's big, right? It's actually a big thing to engage in these small things, right? Uh, you know, because it, it opens up the horizon of imagination of that landscape of remembering how we belong to each other, connecting us in kinship to each other, if that makes sense. So thank you for that as well, um, as an offering towards being non engaged in non-dominating, right, um, relationships and in non-dominating landscapes. So thank you for that. I also want to lift up the fact that people are making really great suggestions, recommendations. For instance, Scott, thank you for recommending the author, um, Brian Zond, right? Um, 
as well as I think the Richard and Eve um, put forward a suggestion for the future, more time in small groups and reports from small groups. Um, uh, we take that for, to heart. So thank you for suggesting that. So I think maybe this is our intention is to actually engage with that even further. So thank you for that. Um, uh, others wanna share or comment? Uh, so Joanne and I uh, spent some time talking together and we also talked about the family values um, and the sort of non-hierarchical structure. We spent considerable time also talking about, you know, how violence is uh, absolutist in its in domination, right? And so we were thinking about just this idea of domination and absolutism. And I, I pointed out um, that I'm struggling with, you know, what, what sort of is less represented in our North American paradigm are indigenous cultures and how indigenous cultures see conflict and war. So there's a lot about redemptive violence and there's not a whole lot of space for uh, authentically defensive violence, right? So say that there is a an enemy troop that's been fed um, fascist and genocidal ideology for generations, century, millennia, invades a border with an intent to, to slaughter. And so I think at that point, there's a, there's a real strong case made uh, for defensive violence. Um, and I'm thinking here of the Armenians, who just two years ago were slaughtered by Azerbaijan and Turkey, 5,000, and, and it was really missing from our Western media because mm -hmm. we haven't meddled there as much. And so this sort of, uh, if nonviolence is to be, it seems to me there's a kind of, as you were speaking, um, I think that there was something that struck, struck me is that if nonviolence is to not be a dominating force, it needs to shy away from being absolutist um, so that it's not reductionist, so that it doesn't um, ignore the lived realities of people who are facing existential threats because there's something there to be really grappled with. And I struggle with that as an Armenian. So I, I brought that into the conversation and I wonder what will, what will, how, as we move forward, how we'll grapple with that, I think. And we are going to, yeah, go ahead, Edward. I'm sorry, go for it. No, I was going to say, as we move forward, how, how we'll grapple with, with the idea of defensive war, existential threat, uh, because it's, it, it, it appears sometimes privileged to make suggestions of absolutist nonviolence to indigenous communities and people who are struggling with very li different lived realities than those are represented in our North American media and consciousness. No, and I think, you know, this is, we are going to be talking about this, especially when we start getting to talk about just war. You know, what does just war mean, right? You know, um, and I invite you to just, we are gonna wrestle with this because this is something that Dr. Wink really hones in on and why Dr. Wink and others really adhere to nonviolence, right? Nonviolence is a powerful strategy, right? Um, even in the face of annihilation, Edward. So I, we're, I'm gonna invite you into this space of, well, what does it mean in the face of annihilation to actually be nonviolent? Right. To be nonviolent in that space. What does that look like? How do we navigate through that? What is the possibility of that? And where do we, where are our edges with that? Right. Right. Where are edges with that? Because we get into these sort of, we will get into these conversations of wrestling with, right, the slippery slope of just war. What does, what is a just war? And to whom is that just war for? Right. Um, yeah, I just our analysis, though, needs to also step away from military imperialism is really obviously not just war. Right? Yeah. But remember that even just war, right, is just violence, right? Just violence is right. Legitimizing, right. Aggression um, toward another um, and to really deeply think about what that is. Right. Um, so it doesn't have to be attached to war itself. Right. Right. But it's attached to the violent act toward another. Right. Um, and not just another, but to a whole group. It becomes it, it's not just individual to individual anymore. And so we'll get to that in the next few cha in, in chapters coming here. Um, so I invite you to bring that in. Absolutely. So Edward, I actually would love, I'm, I'm going to invite you even more actively into this space, especially if we're going to spend more time in discussion with each other. So. 
I'm, which I'm I take welcome. seriously. We need to do that more. I need to hear from all of you more. So I'm very I'm grateful for the space that you're all you're curating, and I've I've annotated until chapter eight. So I look forward to our next sessions. Yeah, beautiful, absolutely, yeah. Others, and you know, thank you for folks who are in the chat <clears throat> saying things like nonviolence is a philosophy of life, much more than not being violent. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. others wish to sort of comment or share. I'm afraid that uh, many of our stories would take more time than we have right now. <laughs> um, I had a thought, um, something that's always like in the back of my head, never we're talking about nonviolence is like, um, like power, like I guess like resource power dynamics and like how that, I feel like in, in a way, like as like people who have privilege of all kinds, like we take part of in on like many levels, like something that's always like really like in the back of my head whenever I'm on like a Zoom meeting is like the resources that went into like building the computer that I'm on and like how like wars are fought to acquire more resources and how like how hard it is to actually really disentangle myself from that. Mm. No, absolutely. And it, and it's important. I think this is why we need to wrestle with power. Absolutely. Power is clearly um, grounded in this and power dynamics. But and this is why I think in this chapter, equity is so important for Dr. Wang, you know, really thinking critically about what is equity. Because, because in that, right, power can control resources, access to th all of these things, right? And I think Dr. Wink is really clear about, right, in order to create non-domination realities, right, we actually have to almost, the, the more revolutionary act is to work, walk toward equity, right? Um, and to think about, really critically think about what relationships look like in that equity, right? Um, and this is where we need to really wrestle with that that work this that those ideas in relationship to power, power dynamics and resource, resource allocation, sourcing where things are sourced, how things are sourced, why we are sourcing that way, why are we consuming in that way? Absolutely. So thank you for that insight. Go for Can it. I, yeah, just to, to speak to what Gladys said, I, I we 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 definitely try to keep to the. 8:30 stop, but I don't want to artificially. If, if there's real, if there's real, this is sacred space. If there's real energy here, if people want to stick around for a few minutes, if, if Fernando can, yes, I'm happy. I don't want to. I don't want to stop somebody. If, so if somebody really wants to share, I don't think the point is to get off by 8:30 because we're already 8:30. No, and I, I, I will stay. I will, I will stay as long as the group wishes to stay. So Gladys, yeah. please feel free to um, share if you wish to. That is, it's really important to hear your voice. So. The, um, the story that was coming to my mind is a situation that's happening in my community right now where um, there are a lot of people who are very poor people who are being made more poor by the, the, um, their inability to work, their inability to, to take care of themselves during COVID. And um, our, uh, our administrative group in, for the, our county is utilizing almost all the money that we're getting as relief money for those people to enlarge a jail. Uh. And so there's been a lot of resistance to that, um, to that situation in trying to convince people to spend money to help poor people and their absolute refusal to consider help for poor people. Mm -hmm. And, um, the mm -hmm. oppressive quality is just incredibly, and, and the di difference between the privilege and the abject poverty is just so intense. Um, and it has been very difficult to think about what, um, and, and, and that so I myself and uh, many other people I know have become very hot over this issue. So I have to admit that right off the bat. I have not been a very good nonviolent uh, advocate at this point. It feels to me like um, the, the direction that we are going is neither 
helping the situation or upholding my own values for nonviolence. Mm -hmm. And, um, it, and it's not like it's going to become physically violent, but it is definitely there. The energy is not in, in a good direction. So, you know, this has been real challenging to me to kind of think about what am I supposed to do, to do in this situation? <laughs> no, absolutely. And that's that, you know, Gladys, I don't think you're alone in that. I, I'm going to just join with you and say that, that you know, to, to maintain a nonviolent stance is really challenging given the domination system that we're in. Right. Especially when you are faced with right people who are suffering deeply, mm -hmm. right? people who are like absolutely suffering. So I had a conversation with FOR with one of my other interlocutors, Coffee Dixon, who's um, whose uh, documentary film is on PBS now, right? Um, a rec it's called A Reckoning in Boston. And I'll, I'll send the link to Bill to post under the wink um, thing. Her life is consistently being annihilated, Gladys. I witness her every day. And when I see her, I see how people, forces, are literally seeking to not only destroy her, but to erase her from the face of this earth. And it makes my blood boil, Gladys. It absolutely makes me want to act in absolute violence against the powers, the fallen powers that seek to annihilate her from the face of the earth, from the city of Boston, from living and flourishing, not even flourishing, not even surviving, right? Because there are people who do not see her as human. And it takes all of me, it really takes all of me, right? To do my best, right? To engage in a process of nonviolence and to really interrogate what that looks like in my everyday life, because it's so a lot- So what does that look like? I really wanna know, what does that yeah. look like? Yeah, well, it, it, you know, I will just say, it, 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 it's taken all of me not to pull out a gun, right? And defend her property and defend the land that she's making like doing um, a food security intervention for her people, right? But you know what, actually what happens is that, I, this is why I love the idea of kinship, right? Of connecting with others that are in the community and work, doing the hard work of going, yes, at the same time of being annihilated, right? At the same time that I see your annihilation, I'm gonna join you in this space and we're gonna transform this in some way. Like, like, I will walk with you to City Hall, right? And support you in navigating through the policies that seek to erase you, right? And if you can't be there because they, you, they don't want you to be there, how can I work with you to be there so that we can attend to this, right? Oh my gosh. Knowing that it's not perfect, Gladys, it is not perfect, okay? Because yeah. they're starting to shut the doors on me now, right, Gladys, right? Yeah. You need yeah. a bigger circle. <laughs> Precisely. So I become kins with people I don't necessarily perceive myself being in kinship with, mm -hmm. right? This is why I invite us to think of uneasy coalitions and uncomfortable coalitions, because sometimes we need to work with others, right? To engage with the powers in a way, fallen powers in a way, to keep on, to keep on, right? Knowing that I'm at the crosshairs as well now. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, there's, you know, Dr. Wink and June Keener Wink have invited me to go. You're yes, you're at the crosshairs, Fernando. Your body is there. If you talk, if you ever get a chance to talk to Dr. Uh, to June Keener Wink, I invite you to look at her YouTube videos. I was telling her about this in the break. Like, how are our bodies inv invested in this work, this redemptive work? Mm -hmm. Your body is on the line, Gladys, just as my body is on the line. Yeah. You know, and this is not easy work. This is not easy work, especially in the domination system where a tendency is to go, hey, I'm going to actually react in this with violence. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate Gladys. Thank you for what you've shared. And I appreciate you lifting that up. And we're going to wrestle with but it. Then yeah. The other side of that is that once you have slipped into, once you slide down the slippery slope and that angry word comes out of your mouth or that um, uh, something that really comes out of a, a sense of, of violence, 
then how do you step back from that and heal that? You know, and that's another thing that. And that's another thing where we'll talk about this also in the later chapters of the repair and the renewal, right? The yeah. possibility of renewal, right? Yeah. The possibility in the space of redemption, what that renewal looks like. And again, that's a process. Remember, we're not in the fortress, right? We're in the journey yeah, yeah, yeah. where we're in the journey together. Yeah. And I think the invitation of both Dr. Wink and June Keener Wink is to stick with this journey, right? To be in journey, to be in process with each other. Does that make sense to everyone yeah. here in the room, not just to Janet, <laughs> to Gladys, right? Thank you for that. I really appreciate it. No, I no, J Gladys, I appreciate your words and thank you for being really honest and transparent. I really appreciate um, your presence here. So thank you for that. Absolutely. So do others want to comment or to share? My name is Barbara Williams, and I'm uh, going to say that I really enjoyed this last five minutes because I'm feeling like Gladys, and I really did feel I was struggling. And I'm glad she did speak out because I was struggling as to where I am and what can I do. Mm. Thank you, Gladys, for bringing that up. Absolutely. Thank and thank you, Barbara, for lifting that up, too. So thank you for for being present with this, too. We are struggling together, and I hope, Barbara, that we can continue to struggle together with this. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that, Barbara. Good night. Good night, Barbara. OK. And and so I, you know, if if there are no comments, I know we're, we've gone over a little bit, and that's okay. As Bill said, this is totally fine. We, we're more, we will, we can stay on longer. And you know, I think next time when we gather, uh, we will uh, spend a little bit more time in in our plan in our larger group. Okay, and so we're going to invite ourselves into a more discussion to get into it. So I will keep my lecture really <laughs> tight. But I will hold each of you, hold me accountable to keeping it really tight. Okay, so I'm going to invite that as well. So I appreciate um, the, the comments and the sharing and your time and your presence, um, both in our large group as well as in our breakout sessions. So and the, there's some really powerful stuff. Thank you, Fernando. I just to jump in. I'm going to have, have you come in in a second just to maybe pray us out at the very end. Yeah. Um, but uh, some really amazing conversation going on with Edward and James and others. So really a lot to, to hold and please let's hold, bring this to the next uh, meeting. Uh, wh what, what chapters do you want to cover next time? Um, are we going to do chapters uh, four and five or what do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think that's what we were. Yeah. Four and five, I believe. <laughs> Yeah. So please, and thank you, Paula, for being here, and June Keenerwink for being here as well, and, and everybody, to Anthony and Susan for all their help. Uh, we're going to have everything up as soon as we can. We'll have the video up tomorrow, hopefully by tomorrow, maybe the next day, forusa.org slash wink. That is the page, forusa.org slash wink. So please check it out there. And if you have comments or things you want to add to a conversation there, please feel free to add it there. We will keep the conversation going as best as possible. And then in two weeks, uh, we will pr publish a, a video, uh, inter an inter interlocutor sort of event with with um, with Fernando and one of his colleagues uh, that kind of leads us up into our March 31st event, which will be uh, Thursday, March 31st, I believe, uh, at 7 p.m. So I'd like to ask Anthony, to, Anthony Nicotero, our uh, FOR's uh, interim executive, uh, co-interim executive director, to say just a couple brief words and then just please hand it over to Fernando and then we'll, we'll pray us out. But thank you so much for this great conversation, for your attentiveness and for your willingness to share. It's been very powerful. Well, I'm just gonna say uh, briefly, as someone who has attempted to practice and teach uh, the powers that be in Walter and June's work for the last 20 plus years, and having the privilege right now to serve as the interim co-executive director of FOR with my colleague and friend who many of you know, Ethan Vesley Flad, who couldn't be here tonight. I just uh, have much deep gratitude in my heart for each of you. And I wanna express that gratitude to June again, echo that to Fernando who embodies this fellowship, to our inaugural donors who've made this fellowship possible, to each of you for your investment of time and energy and for uh, your commitment really to struggling with how we dismantle the domination system how we uh, 
as Reverend Dr. Emma Jordan Simpson, our executive director uh, who helped build this fellowship would say, how we together subvert the world order in the spirit of Walter Wink and June Keener Wink. So thank you. Uh, I look forward to ongoing conversation and I uh, will pass it to uh, Fernando uh, who will pray us out. Thank you. So thank you. And again, I wanna say thank you to each of you for being present today. So I'm gonna read our closing prayer from Dr. Walter Wink's Jesus and Nonviolence, A Third Way. So great creator, let us pray. Seize the moral initiative, find a creative alternative to violence, assert your own humanity and dignity as a person, Meet force with ridicule, ridicule or humor. Break the cycle of humiliation. Refuse to submit or to accept the inferior position. Expose the injustice of the system. Take control of the power dynamic. Shame the oppressor into repentance. Stand your ground force the powers to make decisions for which they are not prepared. Recognize your own power. Be willing to suffer rather than to retaliate. Cause the oppressor to see you in a new light. Deprive the oppressor of a situation where a show of force is effective. Be willing to undergo the penalty for breaking unjust laws. Die to fear of the old order and its rules. Amen. Blessings to each of you this evening, and we will see you next time. Fernando, could you, could you add that prayer to your what you send out later. I'd sure like yes. to have access we will, to that. We will put that also on the Wink page as well. Okay. Absolutely, Gladys. Blessings to each of you. Go in peace and with prayer. See you okay. soon. Bye. Take care. Bye.